Judge McCasey, thanks for joining us today. Good to uh, be here. So you've been uh, highly critical of FBI Director James Comey's recommend, decision not to recommend prosecution of Hillary Clinton uh, for mishandling classified information. Can you tell us why uh, you believe she should have been prosecuted? Well, um, I think the reasons why she should have been prosecuted were essentially virtually outlined in his presentation. Um, number one, she maintained a private server to handle classified information. Um, there are at least two statutes bearing on that. Uh, number one makes it a, a, f a misdemeanor uh, to remove from its proper storage place classified information and put it where it doesn't belong. Um, it doesn't require anything other than that. Um, it's clear that she knew about that. Um, he claims that there was, um, a, there, was, there was no proof of knowledge. I'll get into that in a minute. The second statute is a felony, which says that if you have classified information and have it disclosed as a result of gross negligence, uh, not even knowledge, but purposeful action, gross negligence, then um, you're subject to, a, to, a, to, to prosecution. That's a 10-year felony. Um, the Congress wanted people who handled that kind of information to handle it carefully. He said she was extremely negligent. Now, or extremely, extremely careless, I think was his expression. Um, I know of no logical distinction between extremely careless and grossly negligent. Um, nor did he explain why there is one. Um, so far as lack of knowledge, number one, the statute doesn't talk in terms of knowledge. But even if it did, judges all the time find that misrepresentations of fact, uh, destruction of documents, can be used as circumstantial evidence of knowledge. She, by his own account, lied repeatedly in public the fact that she didn't lie to the FBI, or so he says, is totally irrelevant. She made misrepresentations. She destroyed documents, again, by his own account. That could be used by a jury to find knowledge. And the fact is that people have been prosecuted, certainly under, under, under both statutes, for doing less. There have been soldiers who have been subject to prosecution under that, under that felony statute for taking classified information, putting it in a friend's drawer and forgetting to, to take it out and give it back, um, and have faced felony charges. The soldier who did that did two years in jail, forfeited pay, and was given a, a, a dishonorable discharge. So he's, he brought, some people have brought up the case of General Petraeus um, and have said that what, what she did is far worse than General Petraeus. And he, he said quite that actually what General Petraeus did was far worse, that he not only intentionally classified and shared classified information, but he also hid the document in his, in his attic and then lied to investigators about it. And so he said, this quote from Comey, so you have obstruction of justice, you have intentional misconduct and a vast quantity of information. He admitted he knew that he was wrong, it's the wrong thing to do, it's a perfect illustration of a case that gets prosecuted. So is, is the Petraeus case actually worse or, or, or not? It's different. Mm -hmm. um, there is different kind of evidence. She had, uh, his, his disclosure of the information was to somebody who had herself top secret clearance. She wasn't authorized to see those documents, but she did have clearance, number one. Number two, it is entirely clear that there was no spillage. In other words, nothing leaked out from the information that he disclosed. She gave the documents back. Nothing made its way into the biography or any other document that she wrote. Whereas in the case of, the, of Secretary Clinton, it is clear that um, I mean the, the 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 FBI the FBI director himself said that she had um, treated this information in such a way that it was clear that it had probably been hacked by foreign powers, and that she herself had engaged in practices uh, when in in territory controlled by foreign powers, hostile powers, uh, that lent her communications to interception by those s foreign powers uh, that are, who are sophisticated in, um, in dealing with that kind, doing that kind of stuff, and who are our adversaries. So there was far more danger to the national security from what she did than from what he did. Now, you pointed out uh, that even if the CIA knew that Russia, China, or Iran, or another hostile power had gotten, gotten this information, they'd probably never disclose it because that would reveal to those people that we had the ability. So I don't are, know. Are we ever, are we ever going to? Pro probably never, but they, 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 there's ample reason and certainly some precedent for the fact that they would not, they prefer not to disclose it. But are we ever going to find out the true uh, extent of the damage that was done by this episode, by her, by her mishandling of this information? Um, I hope not. 
Because if we ever find out the true extent, uh, we may find it out to our great regret. Mm -hmm. Now, he said uh, that no reasonable prosecutor would indict Hillary Clinton. That was his, his standard. You supervised the nation's prosecutors as, a, as attorney general. You were a federal judge. Uh, is that just an untrue statement, or is, uh, is, is he right? I don't know what the basis is for that statement. Um, I have seen reasonable prosecutors bring cases on less evidence and win cases on less evidence. Um, I don't stand alone in that. Rudy Giuliani, who himself was something of a, of a prosecutor, um, has said the same thing. Um, there is dynamite evidence in this case um, of what she did and evidence of her state of mind, notwithstanding what the director of the FBI said. Uh, Trey Gowdy kept pointing out during the hearing how many times she had uh, got him to say, yes, she, that was untrue, yes, this was untrue that she said, and he pointed out that repeatedly lying about something is generally used as evidence of, of knowledge and intent in, in, in uh, criminal cases. That's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely right. And as far as negligence never being the, 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 uh, the standard for a prosecution, um, criminally negligent homicide is prosecutable, I think, in just about every state in the union. Uh, and, the only, and the director's only response to that is, well, I don't really know about state practice. But the, some have the notion that it's unfair or unreasonable for Congress to have made that judgment. When you're talking about national secrets, yes, if you treat those in a grossly negligent way, that should be the equivalent of, of, of criminal intent because you're not supposed to deal with secrets that way. Mm -hmm. You not only criticized Comey's decision, you took issue with him publicly announcing his recommendations and saying he stepped way outside of his job. What did you mean by that? The recomm the, first of all, it's not, it's not at all clear that the FBI always makes recommendations in cases. It is, is the Federal Bureau of Investigation, not the Federal Bureau of Prosecution, and that's certainly not the Federal Bureau of Determination. They investigate, bring the facts to lawyers in the Justice Department, and here, as I understand it, they were working with Justice Department lawyers, and they may very well, in the course of bringing them the facts, make a recommendation, but they make it in the context of a confidential communication between fact gatherers and prosecutors in mulling the facts of a case, talking it over, figuring out whether it pays to go ahead. They don't just get up publicly and announce that their recommendation is that no prosecution be brought. Mm. You've, uh, there's a new poll out that shows that 56% majority of Americans say Hillary Clinton, the FBI decision was wrong, that Hillary Clinton should have been prosecuted. Uh, only 35% agreed with, with Comey's decision. Those are pretty stunning numbers. Um, what, what does it mean for the rule of law in our country when, when you have a majority of Americans believe that one, the pr potential president of the United States should be in the jailhouse, not the White House? And what does it, does this undermine trust in our, in the impartiality of our justice system, that there's a double standard and there's a different law for people like Hillary Clinton and a different law for the rest of us? I don't think it's good for, um, the, for the standards and I don't think it's good for uh, public confidence in the rule of law that people believe that. Uh, that level of cynicism um, is something that really hurts and it hurts not only in this, in, in this case, uh, but it hurts in other cases as well. You know, the, that 56 percent, those people are going to be called to sit on juries and they're going to be asked to decide facts, facts presented by prosecutors. What are they going to think of the cases that are presented by the government or by the state um, when they have that level of cynicism about the way the, the, the process works generally? So you, you, know, you were served as attorney general. Uh, if this had happened, something like this had happened during the Bush administration, how would you have handled it differently? I don't like to do shoulda, coulda, woulda. Mm -hmm. um, the way to handle any case is to have it investigated by the people who do the investigating and without leaks, and that part was done right. Mm -hmm. The FBI didn't leak anything during this investigation. To have people in the Justice Department who are familiar with this kind of prosecution cooperate with the FBI in working, in, in, in developing the facts and, and, and steering the investigation, and then have a determination made on the basis of what the facts are and not based on what the political results are. Um, there's a Latin maxim, um, and I don't want to ruin the Latin, but it, it translates out as, uh, you know, let, let justice be done though the heavens fall. And that's the maxim that should govern here. Uh, you don't decide cases uh, or decide whether to bring cases based on what you think the implications will be, the political implications will be, or the the, the, the results will be in a larger setting than the courtroom. Um, once you start doing that, um, 
uh, you're, on, you're on very dangerous ground. And if what he was trying to do was um, split the baby, uh, then apparently nobody ever told the director that the wisdom of Solomon lay in the fact that the baby ultimately was not divided. Otherwise, it would be the, the cruelty of Solomon or the barbarity of Solomon or maybe even the gross negligence of Solomon. <laughs> Um, you, you were critical of Attorney General Lynch's meeting with, uh, with Bill Clinton. I mean, what would you have done if you were on the plane and the former president was, in, was saying, I'd like to come on board and talk to you? Well, um, Nancy Reagan had great advice in that situation, which is just say no. Um, but if you can't avoid the meeting, that's what you have staff people for, to sit in on meetings and take notes and record everything that's said on both sides. Apparently that didn't happen here. Um, I had a similar situation when I was at the department. I had a visit from a foreign official. Um, I'm not going to disclose from where or what the nature was of his, uh, of his business. And um, he came in, he had his people with him, and he said, can I talk to you privately? I said, no. Um, and so we sat down with a couple of his people, a couple of my people, and um, we proceeded to discuss the topic he wanted to discuss. And I'm very glad that I had people there. Um, because what he wanted to talk about was something that we couldn't do and shouldn't do. Uh, and I didn't want a private conversation about that. And, he, and she also didn't disclose the meeting. Uh, you know, the, the meeting had happened, I think, on a Monday, and it was only on like a Thursday when, when, the, when someone asked her, a reporter found out about it. So they didn't even go, you know, the first thing I would think you would do if that happened would be to immediately announce that I've met President Clinton and he was, a, you know, at, le at least be forward about it. Uh, they didn't even they didn't even disclose the existence of the meeting until they were caught. Right. Um, what, so you said that she should have after that she should have recused herself, but she refused to do that. So she testifies before uh, before Congress and more than eighty times refuses to answer any questions relating to the case. So she she refused to recuse herself, but then wouldn't so make, which means it was her decision, but then refused to answer questions. Was, was did she have an obligation to explain to the American people? Uh, that decision and I think answer those that questions? When you're talking about a case like that, um, there, of that visibility, that notoriety, and that importance, that yes, there's an obligation um, for what the director described, but I don't think fulfilled, as um, extraordinary uh, transparency uh, or unusual transparency. Um, yes, you should describe it and describe it in truthful terms. Um, in fact, in deferring to the FBI during her testimony, she, I, she seemed to get it backwards. The FBI works for her. Um, I mean, the, the, the director reports to her. They didn't work for her. I mean, obviously, they work for the, for the people at large. But the director of the FBI reports to the, to the attorney general. The attorney general doesn't report to the director of the FBI. And she even refused to answer qu basic legal questions. Like, she was asked point blank, is it a crime to share for someone who's cleared to see classified information to share it with someone who's not cleared to see that information? And she said, "I will refer you to the uh, to the director uh, to the uh, director Comey's statement." But Dr director Comey is not director Comey because he is there to make legal judgments. He's not. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was once deputy AAG, and he's a very fine lawyer. But that's not what that's not the function of the office that he holds. That's why I said he. He stepped outside the function of his office. Do you think, based based on what we've learned about this, uh, about her conduct, that if Hillary Clinton was, uh, you know, Hillary Mukasey or Hillary Teeson or so, had some other last name, that she would ever, and she applied for a job, that she would ever get a security clearance? With with this record, with this it's record, inconceivable. Yeah. How about her aides? So her aides are, uh, you know, she's. If, let's say she's elected president, and, and some of these aides who are implicated in this, they would they have trouble getting security clearances to work in her administration? Look, I don't know precisely what they did, but mm -hmm. whatever got done, it certainly didn't get done alone by her. Mm -hmm. um, somebody took that material and put it on her server. Um, somebody, you know, steered that material to her, and somebody processed her messages at going out. Um, and whoever that were, or whoever they were, whoever that was, or whoever they were, um, those people ought to be um, examined. And, and uh, if after that they don't get a security clearance, I wouldn't be surprised. A lot of people were very disappointed 
uh, with Comey and had higher, high expectations for him because he had this reputation of being a straight shooter. He's the guy who walked into the Oval Office and told, told Bush that he would resign if he didn't, if he reauthorized the NSA program as it was, had that famous meeting in, in Ashcroft's hospital room. And so they were expecting him a, little, a little bit to, for him to be similarly independent in this case. I mean, should, should, are people right to be disappointed? Or were the expectations too high to begin with? Well, I was disappointed. Um, but um, there's another view. I mean, the, there were columns, there were, there's an editorial, there were a column in the Wall Street Journal in which people said he was doing the sort of thing he'd done before. So I'm, I'm, there were a couple of views on that. I, I know the man. I don't want to sit here and skip rocks off him. But yeah. um, I was disappointed. Yeah, the uh, you also expressed uh, confidence in the career FBI folks. There, there are reports that they were required to sign uh, very strict non-disclosure agreements, uh, which seems to be an effort to make sure that if there was dissent within the ranks, that it not be aired publicly. That basically they're not allowed to speak unless they're called to testify under oath before Congress. I mean, is that a common practice in these situations? And are they trying to squelch dissent? Well, I I don't know about these situations because I don't know of any similar situation and. Um, I, I just don't know of any similar situation, um, and why they're doing it. I think it's fairly obvious. Yeah, um, Comey pointedly refused to answer whether there's still an ongoing investigation in the Clinton Foundation. Uh, do you think that there may be? Uh, what, what is your what is your what is your sense that this? Well, um, it's pretty clear from what we know that there should be, um, given the decisions that were made by the Secretary of State, the money that was contributed to uh, the foundation, and from whence it came. Let's let's talk about uh, about uh, judges. Judges have been front and center in the presidential campaign. You're a former uh, federal judge, in addition to a former uh, uh, attorney general. You wrote a, recently wrote a Wall Street Journal column about Donald Trump's uh, calling into question whether a federal judge that was born who was born in Indiana uh, but had Mexican parents could objectively. Uh, sit on a, on the case regarding Trump University, and you mentioned in that that you had had your objectivity challenged by by a, uh, a criminal uh, defendant at one point. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that happened. Um, well, that happened during um, the trial of in a case called United States versus Abdul Rahman. He was known as uh, among other, as the Blind Sheikh, and um, the lawyers who were representing at that point a couple of the defendants um, who ultimately were edged out of the case. Um, the first day uh, said that I should um, not be on this case because I was the wrong religion and so on and so forth and, and my wife uh, was the principal of a Jewish school and so on and I said, well, you know, you want to make a recusal motion, make it. And it wasn't for several months that they did and eventually they did make a recusal motion and urged and asked me uh, as part of that motion uh, to answer a whole list of questions about um, my religion and my wife's school and, and my ties to the state of Israel and people in the state of Israel to the third degree of consanguinity, as I recall it, the question went, and um, just a whole lot of other stuff. They, they, the, the premise for their um, motion was that Israel was a victim or an intended victim of the 93 Trade Center bombing and therefore um, I would have a relationship with a victim. So, the, but, so is there a big difference between what Trump said about this judge and what, what the terrorists said about you in the sense that they're basically saying, he's basically saying that someone with Mexican-American parents uh, couldn't objectively rule on any case relating to him because he wants to build a wall. These guys were saying, because you're a Jew, uh, you can't rule on terrorism cases. Right. You know, people have tried this a lot. Um, they've tried it with African-American judges and um, there are decisions and they've tried it with, with female judges in, in, in sex discrimination cases. Um, I guess by, by that standard, the only, way, the only person who could sit on a sex discrimination case is a hermaphrodite. Um, I mean, you know, you, you're either a man or a woman, usually. Um, usually. Usually. <laughs> uh, so, and, and the, look, the fact is that uh, that provides no basis uh, for recusal. And uh, there's no rational reason for arguing that somebody, uh, that an African-American judge who had a long history of, of uh, civil rights involvement before he went on the bench can't sit on a civil rights case. And if the judge feels that he can't, then, or she can't, then they recuse themselves. And there's a recusal motion, as you pointed out, that they can, someone can make. If they, somebody if they, can make a motion. So, and a so. judge is, I mean, if a, if a judge knows of reasons why the judge can't be objective, uh, or why somebody could reasonably question their objectivity, reasonably is the key word, then they're obligated to recuse themselves regardless of whether there's a motion. 
Sure. Now, it's interesting because, of course, uh, what, what Trump said was troubling to a lot of people, but isn't the left a little bit culpable in all this in the sense that you, you pointed out in your piece that uh, J Justice Sonia Sotomayor said that uh, famously said that her background as a wise Latina with the richness of her experience would more often than not reach better conclusions than a white male who hasn't lived that life. Um, so aren't Trump's critics sort of have, trying to have it both ways? They, they have, embrace identity politics when it comes to judges when it's favorable to them, but they, they're offended when someone brings it up in the other direction. Sure. Um, I mean, I attended um, the confirmation hearing for a highly qualified young woman um, and heard lots of references to um, somebody being the first Asian or the first woman or whatever. And uh, I can understand that a little bit. But when you start picking judges that way and expecting them to rule consistently with what you believe they should rule as women or as African Americans or as Jews or as Hispanics or whatever, um, then you've stopped having a justice system. Um, I pointed out in the piece, judges wear black robes in part as a, a, to symbolize the idea that they're supposed to be all the same. It shouldn't matter whose head is popping out from under the black robe. Um, it may very well matter. Some judges are better than others. Some judges have points of view that are different from others. But it's supposed to matter as little as possible. It's aspirational. And when you stop having that aspiration, then you're going to lose a lot of what you should have. And we've, to a large measure, stopped having that aspiration in the United States. So, you know, here we have a situation now with the death of Justice Scalia where the Supreme Court really hangs in the balance in, the, in this presidential election. And it raises an important question, which is, why are Republicans, why are conservatives so awful at picking Supreme Court justices? I can't say why it is because I, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I can suggest that it may very well be because as, as, a, as a general matter, um, the left has followed an agenda of litigating where they don't prevail politically. That is, of pursuing agenda, an agenda in the court when um, perhaps the, the, the legislature doesn't give them what they want. And so the judges then become very important to them, whereas conservatives haven't followed that practice, um, or at least haven't followed it to that extent, and certainly not as long. Um, I mean, this all started, in, at least in my mind, with a case called Griswold versus Connecticut, where there was the, the Connecticut birth control case um, that was brought by people at Yale um, almost as, a, as an exercise. The statute wasn't against selling contraceptives wasn't being enforced. Uh, but they believed it was a, a bad law and, and unconstitutional. And so we got, as a result, the, the right of privacy, which of course isn't anywhere in the Constitution. Um, but this was done to change uh, an outcome. And it's been going on ever since. But I mean, if you think about, uh, if a liberal Supreme Court nominee uh, they can tell you precisely where they stand on key issues, and, and, and it's perfectly fine. I mean, Ginsburg said that uh, right to abortion is central to a woman's life, to her dignity, and she was confirmed 96 to 3. Breyer said abortion is a basic right. He was confirmed 87 to 9. Can you imagine if a conservative nominee had said the opposite? So what happens is, is that the conservative, the liberals go out and they, they are completely open and say what the, basically, well, they say how they're going to vote. Uh, on these things effectively, whereas conservative justices have to be very cryptic in terms of their descriptions of, uh, of, of, uh, of where they stand and talk about philosophy and all the rest of it. I hope, that, and, and I, I hope they're not just being cryptic because I hope that a conservative justice, um, as I would hope that a liberal justice, can say that I'm going to look at the case in front of me um, and the authorities at the time uh, and decide it on that basis rather than on the basis of my own proclivities. Um, and that's, as I said, that's aspirational. Yeah. You're, supposed to, you're supposed to try to do that. I think we need people who um, understand, for example, that when a constitutional decision is wrong, uh, a past constitutional decision is wrong, uh, the fact that it's a constitutional decision is a better argument for reversing it um, than if it were simply an interpretation of a statute. Because Congress can change statutes, mm -hmm. but nobody can change the Constitution. And so if on later examination, um, the court got the Constitution wrong, then it seems to me it's up to, it's up to them and them alone to write it because that's the only way it can be righted. Everybody seems to have forgotten about Merrick Garland. 
<laughs> it's kind of disappeared. I mean, uh, uh, is uh, everyone thought this was going to be a terrible thing for Republicans holding up uh, Barack Obama's nominee? Did, did Senate Republicans make the right decision in not holding a vote on his uh, nomination? That's a that's a political question for sure. them, I guess. But yeah. certainly there is there is ample precedent for holding up um, decisions based on the expected outcome of an election. That's happened before, and um, that was the. In fact, there was, there was during, the, um, uh, during the drafting of the Constitution, there was a debate about whether to um, make um, confirmation, to require confirmation within a certain period of time, and if confirmation were not forthcoming, then um, the, the nominee would automatically, um, the nominee would automatically pass. And that was voted down. And in fact, the person who sponsored that point of view was James Madison, who believed in a very active uh, executive. Um, and that point of view was voted down. So, you know, there's a, there's a very good reason why what they did was, was, was perfectly consistent with the, with, the, with the Constitution. Donald Trump has done something which is sort of unprecedented, which is put out a list of candidates of people that he would uh, consider for the court. Have you looked at that list? Do you, do you, do you, are you impressed not, with the choices? Not really, I, and I don't know. I mean, I haven't looked at the list in detail. I think, um, I can't remember who was on the list. I think I remember knowing one of the people, but I don't remember which one that was. Do we, you know, one of the arguments for people, there's, there's sort of the never Trump crowd out there, and they say, you know, we'll never vote for Donald Trump. But, you know, if, if Hillary Clinton gets elected, then, uh, then she gets to choose Justice Scalia's uh, replacement. Um, and the uh, counter argument to that is, you know, well, we, can we really trust Donald Trump to choose a constitutional conservative in the way you uh, the way you describe? I don't know that that's the counter argument. The counter argument is that he stands for a whole lot of other things and does a whole lot of other things that raise questions about um, his suitability. I don't know that anybody is doing it simply on the basis of uh, picking justices for the Supreme Court. Let's talk about terrorism a little bit. You, you, you've been a, a strong supporter of uh, the tools that the, and an architect of the tools that the Bush administration uh, put into place uh, to, uh, to uh, f fight terrorism, uh, particularly the NSA surveillance efforts. We've now seen terrorist bombings in Paris, Brussels, San Bernardino, Orlando. And do you see the pendulum swing, swinging back a little bit in terms of the public, in terms of supporting more robust counterterrorism policies? Yes, I do. And that's not surprising, but I'm sorry that it takes bloodshed to do it. Um, it shouldn't. And those policies should have been in place uh, and should be in place. And if they were in place and seriously adhered to, it may very well be that some of this could have been avoided. The, uh, you know, if you, th you look at uh, Barack Obama, he said that terrorism takes far fewer lives in America than car accidents or falls in the bathtub. And statistically, that's right. It's a ridiculous analogy because um, nobody is a... F no Accidents happen all the time, regardless of the precautions that you take. Um, nobody is out to kill you in an accident, by definition. It's an accident. Um, same is true, obviously, of falling in the bathtub, which is a subspecies of accident. Um, people can put up with the idea of accidental death, with the, which they do all they can to protect against. Uh, what they can't put up with is, and shouldn't have to put up with, um, is people planning to kill them in large numbers or small numbers. Um, it's the function of government um, to stop such people before they act and protect the populace at large. Um, not to engage in a statistical analysis about whether it's worth doing it, given the number of people who are killed. He seems to treat it as like a manageable problem, a chronic condition. Terrorism is just the new, the, it's, it's like car accidents, it's like bathroom falls, it's, uh, it's like, uh, you know, uh, bad product, uh, pr dangerous products that come out. This is just something that we have to live with. Uh, and expect to live with. We just need to manage it, not defeat it. No, because the, because the function of terrorism is to undermine public confidence in the ability of the government to protect them, um, and therefore to hew more, more closely um, to the views that the terrorists want them, to, want them to adhere to, or to be more accommodating of the views the terrorists represent. And the more you accommodate them, the more of it you get. So one of the things that people say about Barack Obama is that while he rhetorically uh, uh, challenged the Bush administration's policies. He kept a lot of the counterterrorism policies that we had in place. Um, That's uh, true. Which is true. Um, he's been very vigorous with drone strikes. Uh, he's stopped CIA interrogations, which we can get to in a moment. Um, but, you know, if you were sitting down with, you know, in the transition team with the next, next president, let's say it's President Trump, for example, um, what would you advise him in terms of what needs to change in terms of our counterterrorism tools and, and policies? I think one thing that needs to change is that 
we need to um, focus again on intelligence gathering from not only electronic sources but human sources as well. And um, the notion that you kill them with drone strikes, uh, that takes care of the problem, um, I, don't think it's a, I don't think it's a valid one. Um, if you can capture someone, uh, you do a lot better getting information from them than if you kill them. So do you think that, so Trump has said, uh, you know, Barack Obama ended the CIA interrogation program. Uh, Hillary Clinton obviously w wouldn't bring it back. Donald Trump has gone quite the opposite direction. He's saying that waterboarding would be just the beginning <laughs> of what he, uh, well, what he tends to do, and he's going to do waterboarding and a whole lot worse. Look, understand that there were precisely three people who were waterboarded, three. The point is you, you have to have, number one, some, some way of, of getting information from people, and number two, the, the, these techniques were not used to get specific information. They were used to put people in a compliant frame of mind so that they would then provide information, and they did. And a great deal of what would have been harm was headed off as a result, as you documented in your book. Um, we need a classified interrogation program. We don't need to be r running on about how we're going to waterboard people, because once you tell people what you're going to do, you allow them to train to your techniques. Mm -hmm which is the danger of why Barack Obama's decision to release the details of the techniques. Correct. Is there's only a small universe of techniques that, that, are, are, effective. that are effective and right. lawful and right. you know, it's not, it's not like there's a whole shelf of things that we left behind and didn't do in the Bush administration that were legal and not torture. Um, and so that, that's been incredibly dangerous. Um, t the, one of the other things he's, uh, he's proposed uh, in terms of his counterterrorism policy is the ban on Muslim Im immigration until, quote, we know what the hell is going on, unquote. Um, is that even if, is that a feasible policy? Do you think he's actually going to do it if he's elected? And, and is it constitutional even? Um, it may be constitutional because um, nobody's got a right to enter this country and constitutional rights don't protect potential immigrants to this country. So we could discriminate on the basis of religion against people who were not citizens of this country and were overseas if we chose to do it. That said, it'd be crazy. Uh, number one, how do you figure out who's a Muslim and who isn't? Um, number two, you got a whole lot of people who are already here. And number three, you're going to irritate several billion people needlessly and without any effect. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And also, he's, he's and, now... And, and, you know, and let me add one yeah. more. We, we have figured out what the hell is going on. The point is to do something about it, something effective. That's an excellent point. He's tried to tweak it in saying that he's going to ban immigration or suspend immigration from certain countries that are producing terrorists. But ISIS has people from over 100 countries that have come and trained and fought in Iraq and Syria. Sure. It has people in Europe, from Europe. Um, you're going to ban, you ban immigration from Europe? I don't think so. No. Um, so he, uh, so the, the ban on immigration isn't, isn't going to work. I mean, what, what, other, what other tools can he use in place of that? I think he can use um, a sensible program of intelligence gathering um, and um, a seriousness about, about dealing with ISIS. It's going to take, it's probably going to take troops. Um, I'm obviously not in, in the military and I'm not going to presume to talk about military tactics and strategy. Um, but it's going to take, we are the only superpower in the world, so we're going to have to lead it or else it ain't going to get done. And leading it is going to mean special forces of, in a certain measure, uh, people to train and lead um, others. But it's going to take our leadership to do it. Hillary Clinton has proposed not only allowing Syrian refugees in, but actually increasing the number by about 400%. Uh, is, uh, is that a wise thing? Can we, can we vet Syrian refugees to make sure? I mean, we already know that ISIS has used refugee flows in Europe to infiltrate terrorists. Uh, on one hand, we look at these refugees and you see a picture of a kid, a baby with his face down in the sand, uh, drowned, trying to escape. They're trying to escape ISIS. They're trying to escape Islamic radicalism and their heartbreaks and we want to do something for them. And we know that probably 90% of them are good, decent people who uh, don't want to harm us and are just trying to escape Islamic radicalism. I'd go so far as to say 99.999%. Fair enough. But how do, how do we know that they're going to try and use the refugee flows? And there's no documentation. There's no database you can check against. The, the director of the FBI said we can't vet. So we can't let them. I mean, what, what could we, So we, as a compassionate country, what can we do for these people that won't endanger our security? Um, make things tolerable for them where they live. Uh, by creating a no-fly zone, uh, by opposing um, when when we when we draw a, a, a red line, um, the head of the regime that is inflicting most of the damage on them, 
um, and by and by dealing with ISIS in the way that I that I described. Final question, just because it's it's so it's so in the news and so gripped our our country. Uh, we've had we've seen the scene of five police officers shot in Dallas, Texas. Uh, we had that moving uh, moving uh, ceremony the other day where Presidents Bush and Obama came together to to mourn them. Um, but you've also seen some incidents where where people have been uh, been uh, shot by police officers, um, and it seems like our country has just so never been so deeply divided along along the lines of policing and race. Um, I mean, how do we get out of this? How do we come together as a country and back our police, but also, uh, you know, make sure that people who are of African American descent feel safe and feel protected as well? Um, tough question, um, particularly in the moment. Yeah. Um, I think we need to become a country that deals with facts mm -hmm. rather than with narratives. Um, you know, we're becoming kind of a Middle East country. Um, in the Middle East, it's the narrative. Um, the facts don't matter. And it's got to be the facts that govern. Um, statistics say a great deal about uh, the interaction between blacks and police, why it happens, um, and the outcomes. Um, that is not to say that there shouldn't be effective training of police, um, but there is effective training of police. Um, it can be made more effective, and if it can, it should be. Um, but you've got to understand that it has to be based on what actually goes on out there, um, not based on narratives. Thank you for very much for joining us today. Thanks.